thanks for uh, inviting me, John, and it's an honour to talk on uh, the uh, what would be uh, Milton Friedman's uh, 100th birthday. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Milton Friedman's influence on public policy in Australia, um, and in particular about uh, his book Capitalism and Freedom and Freedom and some of the ideas in that and uh, how they permeated um, throughout the uh, the policy. Um, environment in Australia over the last, say, 30 years. Um, so Capitalism, Freedom and, and Freedom was uh, the second book that I read by Milton Friedman. The first was um, Free to Choose. Um, and they're probably uh, the most influential books that I've ever read in terms of my own thinking. Um, I think every economist who's read uh, those two books can remember um, uh, the exact time that they read them and, and, uh, and the influence that they had on them. So if you haven't read them, I encourage you to go and have a, have a look at them. Um, they still t stand the test of time today, the arguments that are, that are um, in them um, and the policy proposals that are put forward are, are still as relevant uh, as when Freedom, uh, Freedom wrote them uh, uh, as they are, are today. Um, so I'll just talk about a few policy uh, ideas that are in capitalism and freedom uh, and uh, how they permeated the Australian um, policy landscape. Um, so the first is uh, international trade. So if you go and read Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman advocated um, abolishing all tariffs and barriers to trade um, and not in exchange for other countries doing so. He advocated unilateral tariff cuts and other cuts um, to trade barriers right across the board without other countries doing so. And the reason he said this was that he noted that, well, other countries, uh, a country can always benefit from uh, getting rid of these um, kinds of barriers. And so in Australia, you know, over the last um, 30, 30, 35 years, we've seen trade barriers come down gradually, um, not by as much as we would have hoped, but it's still um, you know, bipartisan policy, at least that people don't go around um, advocating openly, at least um, to increase tariffs. Um, but then, you know, as we know, there's a lot of uh, non-tariff barriers that are still around, and also we have um, other trade barriers, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end. Okay, but um, Friedman, <clears throat> one of the main ideas in capitalism and freedom is this idea of um, getting rid of trade barriers, and it's certainly today that the major political parties um, at least pay lip service to free trade, if not um, have um, policies to put that um, position forward. Uh, the other big one uh, that's uh, really important for Australia is exchange rate policy. So if you go, uh, again, capitalism and freedom, there's a whole chapter in there on uh, uh, what an appropriate exchange rate policy should be for a country. And for Australia, that's a very uh, important uh, debate. And that we um, uh, so resolved that debate uh, in the early 1980s when we uh, floated the dollar. And Friedman, of course, advocated that. And it's not well appreciated, but, but at the time, in the, in the 1960s, when Friedman was advocating floating exchange rates, there weren't many people who um, agreed with that policy. Okay? And it was a very, very small number of people who um, advocated freely floating exchange rates. And you know, today, we see the kinds of problems that countries have when they try to fix their exchange rates. So you know, Europe has gone the next step to a common currency, um, but we see the kinds of problems that they have um, coordinating economic policy, adjustment to shocks and so on. So Australia is very lucky and it's probably the, the uh, most important policy reform of the last 30 years is the fighting of the exchange rate. If you think about the GFC and how the uh, exchange rate cushioned us from uh, the rest of the world, what was happening over there, and also the mining boom. So it's um, cushioned us against some of the adverse effects of the mining boom, whereas when we have a fixed exchange rate, we got high inflation, government's doing all sorts of crazy things to try to adjust to that. Um, now that we don't have um, such big adjustment to go through when the exchange rates float. So it's a very important uh, policy idea. Friedman put it forward um, almost you know, on his own for a, a number of years and people <laughs> thought it was a sort of crackpot idea to leave the exchange rate to um, something as volatile as market forces. Um, but today in Australia at least I don't think anybody seriously advocates um, going back to a fixed exchange rate. We hear people now and again advocate, you know, Paul Howes will come on the TV occasionally and, and say, you know, we should be targeting the exchange rate, the Reserve Bank should be doing this or that. Um, but, you know, most of the time that's, um, you know, either uh, poo pooed away or ignored altogether. So we don't have many people um, advocating that we should actively intervene um, in, the, in, the, in the exchange rate. Um, the other big one, of course, that Friedman's well known for is um, monetary policy. 
And again, this is one, uh, uh, an area of, um, of uh, debate where Friedman and others uh, uh, who followed his ideas were almost out on their own. Uh, and that's you know, keep, uh, having monetary policy focus um, almost entirely, if not exclusively, on inflation. Okay? Um, so the debate in the 1960s and 1970s was all about the Phillips curve and how there might be this long-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And Friedman, basically, uh, Friedman and others, um, Robert Lucas following him, basically destroyed that idea. It was helped along by um, very high inflation in the 1970s and 80s, of course, and that, um, the Keynesian model and the Phillips curve was basically discredited because of um, the, the evidence that was coming forward. We had both high inflation and high unemployment. Friedman was really um, you know, a, a key advocate of uh, uh, using monetary policy basically to control uh, uh, to control the inflation rate. Other people wanted to do other things with monetary policy. And he also, in Capitalism and Freedom, advocated that monetary policy should be kept out of the hands of politicians, the day-to-day -day management of it, at least. Um, and so if you go in Capitalism and Freedom, there's a, there's a discussion there about all of that. Um, and today, you know, both the major pl political parties support an independent central bank, um, we have the uh, statement on the uh, uh, conduct of, of monetary policy and the agreement between the government and um, the central bank to keep inflation within 2 to 3% on average over the cycle. Uh, and you know, we get occasionally uh, people pop their heads up and say, well, we should be doing other things with monetary policy. But in the long run, I think everybody knows now that um, inflation is the most important, keeping inflation low is the most important goal of monetary policy. And really, if you um, go back over the debate, uh, that's um, Friedman was uh, really the key instigator of, um, of those ideas. Um, so that's monetary policy and, and the central bank. The other one, other two that I'd like to talk about is uh, that are in capitalism and freedom are education funding and uh, military conscription. Um, so it's not well known, but um, uh, Friedman actually advocated in capitalism and freedom something that's like our um, higher education contribution scheme, as it used to be called, I don't think it's called HELP these days, um, whatever it's called. Uh, so basically income contingent loans for uh, funding uh, higher education. Now, if you go and read Capitalism and Freedom a bit more carefully, uh, what we have with uh, HEX is very different from what he advocated. Basically, he advocated um, these income contingent loans as a funding mechanism, but have the market deregulated, have private providers, um, all sorts of other things uh, which are very different from the policy landscape that we have in Australia. But that idea um, of income contingent loans as a way of um, funding higher education uh, began, uh, as far as I know, with Milton Friedman. And when the Australian, uh, uh, that was happening in the Australian policy debate, uh, of course, you know, Friedman never got credit. And uh, my friend Mark Harrison has, uh, always says, well, it's you know, probably a good um, idea on their part not to uh, mention Friedman when they were doing it, because otherwise the idea might not have gotten up if people had suddenly realised that um, this was something that uh, Milton Friedman had originally thought of. The other big idea on education in capitalism and freedom is vouchers for school, primary school and high school. Um, now in Australia, unfortunately, we don't have um, vouchers. Well, we sort of have a voucher scheme, but money goes to schools rather than parents. Um, and Friedman advocated a voucher-style system where uh, the voucher goes to the parents and private schools would compete uh, with government schools. And so government schools would face some competition um, that would force them to improve, um, uh, improve themselves. And the role for government in uh, Friedman's um, system was uh, as a, a white government's role was to uh, maintain standards, quality standards, and be regulated that way, but otherwise there would be a, a free market in, in education, and the funding would be um, uh, government, government funding through a voucher scheme, but the running of schools, the administration, and everything else would be left to um, private, private providers. Um, so you know, we have uh, something akin to a voucher scheme in Australia, but uh, really that idea hasn't taken off, unfortunately, but uh, I think it's a very important policy reform if it was to go ahead, because education um, is becoming increasingly important in a service-based economy, and uh, we need a um, better education system in Australia. Um, so the final one I'd like to talk about is uh, military conscription. So it's not um, widely known that actually Milton Friedman was a key uh, player in uh, uh, the abolition of the draft in the United States. 
Um, so Milton Friedman got together with Walter Oy, who was uh, an economist at, um, uh, uh, at Chicago, and they both uh, wrote a series of papers on the economic costs of the military draft. <coughs> And this started to get picked up by um, Richard Nixon. And Nixon was a, a, a originally opposed to abolishing the draft, uh, uh, but then came around to the idea that, well, maybe um, uh, we should, should look at this. And when he became president, he began a, uh, instigated a commission. And on that panel were um, uh, Milton Friedman and uh, Walter Oy, Alan Greenspan, uh, and a few others. And key other players in the debate were Don Rumsfeld, who was in favour of abolishing the draft. Uh, Bob Dole, again, was also in, in favour of abolishing the draft. And on the other side, you had sort of, uh, you know, uh, conservative Democrats who were, you know, anti-war but pro-draft. And then you had conservative Republicans who were pro-war and pro-draft. And then you had liberal Republicans who were, I'm going to get this right now, uh, anti-draft anti but pro-war. And then, and then you know, so you had every sort of mix you can think of, um, but eventually, at the end of the day, uh, and this panel that they set up, um, Friedman uh, convinced everybody on this on this panel that uh, this was the right way to go, and uh, and the rest is history, as they say, and, and um, the draft was abolished, and uh, a lot of the argument was won just uh, by appealing to the basic economics that Friedman talked about, which was this economic cost of this draft is a hidden cost. Um, you know, we, we draft conscripts into the military and it's like a basically effective a tax on, um, on those people. And we don't get the, the fully um, uh, functioning military because there are people in there who don't want to be there and they're not effective and, and so on. So it was really those sort of economic arguments that won the day and that was all started by Milton Friedman in, uh, in the 1960s. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, some of the ideas that are in capitalism and freedom. Uh, that we um, have today that are around. I'll just talk quickly about um, some of the risks ahead. Um, you know, and so despite Friedman's influence on policy, we still see the, you know, the uh, dark forces of mercantilism roaming the country, trying to wreak havoc on the economy wherever they can. Um, and so we see it in you know, trade policy. We have um, huge subsidies to the car industry, which is another form of protection. Uh, which have no cost-benefit analysis attached to them, uh, and yet car, you know, car manufacturers continue to sack workers and so on in, in a, a non-competitive. We have um, uh, uh, effective subsidy to the book industry um, in, the, in the form of um, parallel import restrictions and so on. So that's a, another uh, a form of protection. Then we have, uh, you know, go to fiscal policy, which is really the big, big danger in Australia and elsewhere at the moment. So if you read Capitalism and Freedom, there's a whole chapter in there on just a simple rule for fiscal policy, government spending and taxation that Friedman advocated. He said, well, instead of worrying about trying to boost aggregate demand and all this sort of nonsense, let's just have a, a, a set of rules that says, let's just assess the costs and benefits of spending, um, you know, the costs of taxation, where do we want government services to be provided, and let's take a medium term view. Okay, let's try to balance the budget, and maybe it'll, you know, we won't, we'll have deficits sometimes, but we won't deliberately go into deficit and rack up debt just for the sake of it. Um, and we can see that, you know, the power of that idea today um, in, you know, in Europe and the US, and to a uh, lesser extent Australia, um, we see that, you know, the problems that are caused by government debt, um, excessive spending and excessive taxation, and really you know, what we need is a set of policy rules along the lines of that Milton Friedman advocated um, in Capitalism and Freedom. Um, and to avoid those sorts of problems. Um, um, so finally, going back to trade policy, what else, uh, what are the other sort of big risks ahead? Uh, well, we now have, in the form of a carbon tax, basically a tax on our exports in Australia. And they're a tax on our exports in which we have the greatest comparative advantage, coal, all right? Um, so the question now is, well, you know, other countries, are they going to tax our um, uh, imports from us or you know, are we going to now follow you know, the lead of the European Union and impose border taxes um, because we've now got a carbon tax and not a lot of other countries have. So the question now is, you know, uh, there's a danger that we could turn around and say, well, we've got a carbon tax, you haven't, so let's tax your goods at the border. That's an attractive idea for some politicians because it's um, basically protection but under the guise of um, some sort of environmental uh, policy. Um, so that's a big danger. And then finally, um, uh, we face a, num a host of um, new threats to individual freedom in Australia. 
Uh, and the one I'd like to mention, and maybe George will uh, talk a bit about it, is um, uh, some uh, uh, these proposals for media regulation. So you should be under no illusion that that represents a serious threat to freedom of speech in Australia. Um, uh, and also, you know, internet regulation. So if you go and read Finkelstein report, there's all sorts of crazy ideas to, you know, regulate blogs and, and uh, all sorts of things. I don't know how they would do that, but um, that's the that's some of the proposals that have been going around. Um, inappropriate labour market regulation in Australia is uh, stifling our productivity, and that urgently needs um, reform. And we have high marginal tax rates that are um, reducing incentives to save and work and invest. So if Freeman were alive today, he obviously had a lot to say about all of those um, new threats to freedom. Um, but the beauty of it is, if you go to Capitalism and Freedom, you can um, read what he had to say about all of those things, because they were most of them were around in one form or another um, when Capitalism and Freedom was written. And so if you're ever short of uh, an idea or, or uh, a way of dealing with some crazy policy proposal, you can um, go and look at Fre Friedman and, and uh, he'll have uh, guarantee that he'll have something uh, very smart and um, uh, very relevant to say about it. And basically, the, you know, the rule that I've always um, followed is that um, Milton Friedman's always right. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if you, so if you think differently from him, you must be doing something wrong. There's exceptions, but um, that's usually a good rule to follow. He's a very smart fellow. If you've ever watched these Free to Choose videos um, or DVDs, um, you know, they're great. Um, and if you haven't, I encourage you to at least go onto YouTube. There's some, some excerpts on YouTube that you can go and have a look at just to see the power of um, how you would debate people. Um, had an answer to every question. Uh, very eloquent, very friendly debater, uh, engaging. Uh, but it was the power of his ideas that um, eventually won a whole host of debates um, and we're benefiting from his insight and wisdom um, in Australia today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. It's interesting to note, given how famous he is for the economics he's done, that near the end of his life, Friedman said that the thing he was most proud of being involved with in his life was ending the draft in America. So, interesting thing when people are throwing at him being an evil right-wing fascist, that this is what he held up as his greatest achievement. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Alex. Uh, we're going to have a short break here for food to come out, and then in about five or ten minutes we'll have the second speaker. So, please.